morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports victims of rape in Edinburgh and the Lothians. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government provides funding of £100,000 per year for the period 2012 to 2015 to Edinburgh Women's Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre. In addition, the Scottish Government are supporting the Rape Crisis Helpline, which receives £260,000 per year for 2012 to 2015. Can I thank the Minister for that answer in mentioning Edinburgh Women's Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre? I wonder if she is aware of uh, the extent of the cuts that they are currently facing, which are threatening essential frontline support services. They are now heavily reliant on donations just to stay afloat. Will the Minister meet with the centre management to discuss their situation with a focus on a possible resolution? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I am aware of, of the issues uh, that have been raised um, previously in, in the Chamber and now by Kezia Dugdale. Um, the Edinburgh Women's Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre currently receive funding from the Violence Against Women's Fund and the Rape Crisis Specific Fund. I am aware that Rape Crisis Scotland has funded a consultant to work with Edinburgh Women's Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre to support them on a range of issues, including their funding strategy. Uh, the, the money uh, available uh, for violence against women is currently uh, all allocated. However, uh, I'm more than happy to meet with the, the local centre uh, uh, managers and, and staff uh, to, to hear their concerns, and uh, we'll, we'll take that forward as soon as possible. Margaret Mitchell. Sir, can the Minister confirm what progress, if any, is being made with a proposal to give legal advice to rape victims at the point at which their medical and sexual history is requested? Cabinet Secretary. I think what I'll do is write to the member about that to give her an update uh, so that I can be accurate in that information. Question number two, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government when the work underway in 2012 on the start-up cost of an independent Scotland will be completed. Cabinet Secretary, Nicola Sturgeon. The Scottish Government has undertaken a range of work to prepare for the transition to independence and our approach is set out in Scotland's future. Uh, pages 343 to 350 in particular explain that a number of factors will influence the size of the one-off investment that Scotland will make in the transition to independence. Uh, these include the negotiations that will take place between the two governments on apportioning assets and securing public services in Scotland and the options chosen for improving systems and providing more modern and responsive public services for people in Scotland over the period following independence. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, well, it is right to point to Patrick Dunleavy's critic of the Treasury uh, numbers. Has he not also made clear that the First Minister's £200 million without the aid of a fag packet would not cover everything? Why is there a cover-up of whatever figures did emerge from the work we knew, know took place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Malcolm Chisholm, I know, will be aware, he'll certainly be aware if he uh, heard uh, this uh, being discussed at the Economy Committee yesterday, there are a number of factors uh, that influence this issue, all of which will in turn be influenced by the negotiations between uh, two governments. Uh, these factors have been explained before. I'm happy to do so again. Firstly, uh, much of the infrastructure associated with delivering reserve services already exists in Scotland and will transfer to the Scottish Government. And I've pointed to welfare and pensions as being uh, examples of that. Secondly, we will have choices to make about the timescales of transition and options about more efficient delivery. And of course, thirdly, there is the issue of wider negotiation about allocation of the UK's £1.3 trillion worth of assets. So we're taking a sensible approach. That approach is set out in the white paper. I note that Professor Young, one of the other uh, academics that the UK Treasury relied on, said in a blog, uh, pointed in a blog to the degree of preparation in the white paper. The UK government, uh, by contrast, I think is guilty of attempting to mislead people on this particular issue, or as the permanent secretary of the Treasury said, misbrief people. I know what option I prefer, and if the poll in the Daily Record today is anything to go by, it's clear what option is winning favour with the Scottish people as well. Yeah. Question three, Gavin Brown. Government, what value was delivered on the ground in 2013-14 by non-profit distribution financed capital investment. Cap uh, sorry, Cabinet Secretary Don Swinney. Presenting officer, the Scottish Futures Trust will update the forecast capital spend at the time of publication of the draft budget 2015-16. It has commenced the update pro process and will publish the value of investment on the ground in 2013-14 along with future forecast capital spend at that time. In 2013-14, the value of projects which had entered construction post-financial close 
was approximately 640 million and projects in procurement totaled approximately 1390 million pounds gavin brown thank you presenting officer um, almost four years on from the npd pipeline being announced can the cabinet secretary tell us how many of the 47 projects are actually built and operational cabinet secretary well, the first um, revenue-funded finance project uh, was opened in 2013-14, which was the Aberdeen Health Village project. As Mr Brown knows, um, there are a whole range of different projects that are now underway. Uh, there is the City of Glasgow College, uh, there is the Inverness College, there is the uh, M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements. Um, and a range of other projects around the country. I have made no secret of the fact that it took the Government longer to implement the non-profit distributing programme than we originally predicted. I have been absolutely open about that with Parliament over time. I have answered numerous questions from Mr Brown and others on that question. I think the question that we should really focus on is why did the Government have to embark on the non-profit distributing programme? We had to embark on it because of the savage cuts in capital expenditure that were applied by the Conservative Government when they came to office, a billion pound every year on our capital budget. And the only reason why the City of Glasgow College has been built just now, and Inverness College has been built, and that the M8, M73, M74 motive improvements have been undertaken is because this Government had the, took the decision to uh, proceed with an NPD programme, and we're now in the process of delivering that programme. Yeah, yeah. Question four, Nigel Don. Supports the fishing sector, and what its position is on the suggestion that the European Fisheries Fund should be spent elsewhere. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Any suggestion that Scotland does not require a fair share of European Fisheries Funds uh, is simply outrageous, and of course is not in Scotland's interests. Going forward, CFP reform will be the biggest challenge the fleet has faced, and it is only right and proper that available European funding reflects the task in hand. To put the available funding into context, Scotland is 8 per cent of EU landings by value, but presently only receives 1.4 per cent of the current European Fisheries Fund. And Scotland receives €21 Euros per tonne of fish landed, the second lowest allocation in the whole of Europe. Nigel Don. I thank the uh, Minister for that response. I'm wondering if you could give me a bit more detail on how the rest of the fund is spread around Europe. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> well, clearly this is down to negotiations, and unfortunately, uh, as the Chamber is aware, the UK Government negotiate on behalf of Scotland in terms of access to European fisheries funds. Many other countries. Uh, with not nearly as significant fishing industries as we have in this country, receive much bigger shares of European fisheries funds, and we get way below our fair share. So I think that says a lot about the priorities of the UK government and how these issues are decided. And therefore, we should have our own voice in Europe so we can get a fair share of European fisheries funds. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Does the minister agree with me that the European fisheries fund's intention has always been to support struggling fishing communities, and that those communities which are struggling in Scotland, those parts of the Finnish fishing industry, will have access to this important funding stream. Does the Minister further agree with me that the Scottish fishing fleet is strong, and that a part of our commitment as EU members is to support those fishing communities across the Union that are struggling, rather than subsidising some of the strongest fishing communities that are already sustaining themselves with great success? Captain Secretary. Uh, well, that's a startling intervention from Jamie McGregor that will be noted by every single fisherman in Scotland and I see fishing sector more widely as well. The fact that a Scottish Conservative MSP has just stood up and said there's justification for Scotland not to have a fair share of European fisheries fund absolutely beggars belief and just shows that the Conservative Party and Jamie McGregor clearly don't have the fishing industry's interests at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Question five, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to extend support for the adoption of environmentally friendly public transport, such as hydrogen and electric fuelled buses. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government is investing in the EU's largest integrated hydrogen transport project, which will refuel Europe's largest fleet of zero tailpipe emission hydrogen fuel cell buses in the city of Aberdeen from late 2014. The Scottish Green Bus Fund is helping our bus industry invest in the latest emission reducing technology and is another clear indication of this Government's commitment to Scotland's bus industry. I recently announced round five of the fund and a budget of £4.75 million, the largest yet. In addition, operators receive the Bus Service Operators Grant at double the standard rate for services operated by low-carbon buses. 
Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for his answer, but given that the technology and the opportunity to take this for, forward further and faster in Scotland is increasingly obvious, will he take the opportunity this year to look at the total amount of money allocated to the support of bus services in the round and see what can be done to ensure that that resource is focused on extending environmentally friendly services? Minister. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we are doing. As I said, five rounds of the Scottish Green Bus Fund, which not only has helped us introduce low carbon buses in Scotland, but has allowed the manufacturers which have won these contracts, one of which, of course, is Indigenous ADL in Falkirk, to develop the technology to help them win orders abroad, something up, uh, upwards of £700 million of orders. So that's substantially to the benefit of the whole of Scotland. But we are looking at further measures. I've mentioned the hydrogen project uh, for the buses in Aberdeen. We're also looking to see how that can be used in terms of ferry services as well. So I think I think we've got a very good record in supporting the bus industry, whether it's through the Bus Service Operators Grant, of course, the concessionary travel scheme that we have, and these uh, investments both in hydrogen buses, low carbon buses, and one or two el fully electric buses, such as the one in Stranraer. I think we've got a record to be proud of, but of course, we'll try and do more in future. Question number six, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to promote an awareness of problem gambling, given its impact on communities. Minister Derek Mackay. I have recently led a summit which included one aspect of this, the prevalence and concentration of betting shops in our town centres. Following this, we are considering a range of proposals aimed at tackling the problem, such as looking at what planning policy can deliver. We have also, together with other devolved administrations, recently written to the UK Government to encourage them to maximise all the options available to address the public health concerns associated with gambling. Jim McMillan. I uh, thank the Minister uh, for that response. And the Minister will be aware of uh, my members' debate uh, recently on the issue of uh, gamble, problem gambling and the fixed odds betting terminals. And I subsequently wrote to all 32 authorities asking them to consider inviting speakers from Gamblers Anonymous into schools to speak with pupils. A number of authorities have agreed to do that, including Inverclyde. And does the Minister agree with me that providing education on the dangers of gambling at a young age is important? And does he welcome a, the move by these councils and also can he provide any further details in terms of the, 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 the thinking that he's actually had as a consequence of the summit that he recently held? Minister. Uh, of course, the uh, summit will produce a report of, of all the issues we discussed, hearing from many experts and communities uh, uh, direct, working very closely with local authorities. The Scottish Government would agree that a preventative approach to the issue of problem uh, gambling is important because preparing young people uh, for adulthood, it does involve alerting them to the risks that are involved. So uh, we thank uh, Mr McMillan for his proactivity uh, on the issue and hope that local authorities do all they can in partnership with us to raise awareness of the risks. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I call question number eight, can I just say uh, to members uh, that there is an opportunity um, to ask slightly longer supplementaries and slightly longer answers if necessary. Question number eight, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of Scottish farm produce is sold elsewhere in the UK. Cabinet Secretary Richard Blockhead. The Scottish Government doesn't hold specific information on the trade Scotland's farmers have with the rest of the UK. However, estimates reported in the Growth Sector Database, which are derived from the latest Scottish Government Global Connection Survey, suggest that in 2012, Scotland exported approximately £655 million worth of crop, animal and hunting-related products to the rest of the UK. Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, and indeed those are the figures that I had identified, which represent nearly 90 per cent, I think the Cabinet Secretary will agree, of the Scottish farm produce sold out with Scotland. My constituent, John Forbes, farms near Stonehaven and provides around half of all broad beans uh, sold in UK supermarkets, as well as peas and pork and beef, and all of that is marketed and sold as produce of Britain under a British brand. Can the Cabinet Secretary simply confirm that in the event of a yes vote, it would no longer be possible to market any of those foods anywhere as produce of Britain to British farm standards? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I just say that post-independence Scotland will continue to be a major export of our fantastic Scottish food and drink produce. 
Uh, I, notice, uh, I notice the comments Mr Forbes has described in Scottish Farmer as a member of the Better Together campaign uh, and his comments and note that uh, Mr Macdonald didn't mention the name of the supermarket that allegedly made those claims. Uh, we are unaware of any supermarkets made those claims. Can I just say to Mr Macdonald that independent France exports £3.8 billion worth of food and beverages to England. Independent Netherlands exports £3.7 billion worth of food and e beverages to, to England. Germany £3 billion worth. The Irish Republic £2.7 billion pounds worth and independent Spain £2.2 2 billion pounds worth and independent Scotland will continue to export to England and the rest of the world with our fantastic food and drink produce and Lewis Macdonald should stop talking down our food and drink yeah, sector yeah. in this country. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the success of Scotland food and drink, which he salutes as do I. Does he share my concerns, though, that given the loss of cattle and sheep from the hills and uplands of Scotland, that enough product may not over time be available to meet the growing export demand for Scottish produce? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do share some of those concerns expressed by John Scott, and that's why I was utterly appalled by the poor budget deal negotiated for Scotland's farmers by the UK Government in Europe yeah, yeah. during the renegotiation of the Common Agricultural Policy. It's also why yesterday, during the statement of how we'll implement that new policy in Scotland, we've announced substantial support for Scotland's livestock sector to give confidence to our producers to produce for that wonderful international market opportunity that does exist, including our unprecedented support for the beef sector with the £45 million investment over the next three years to help develop the beef sector for Scotland and capture these wonderful market opportunities that John Scott refers to. Jim Cube. Presiding Officer, I recently uh, visited uh, a food business in my, uh, my south of Scotland region. Uh, they sell three quarters of their food with the Union Jack on it and uh, one quarter with a salter. told me that uh, if, if, if Scotland became independent, they would have to move their production with their 200 plus employees down south, in their own words. We also know that uh, the, we also, their words themselves, we also know that. Um, Scottish uh, produce, Scottish beef, Scottish uh, lamb has the benefit of being able to uh, be marketed as being sold in Europe, being sold and uh, produced in Scotland, produced in the UK. Would the Minister come back to this uh, Parliament and tell us how much of Scottish meat is sold with the Union Jack on it? Cabinet Secretary. Can I just remind Jim Hume that since uh, this government announced the referendum, Scotland's food and drink industry has absolutely boomed. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I also remind Jim Hume and the other scaremongers in the Better Together campaign that the success of Scotland's food and drink sector is built on the back of the Scottish brand, not exactly. our political constitutional arrangements, and that success will continue beyond independence. Question number nine, David Torrance. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it gives to local authorities updating their transport appraisal guidance reports. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, transport Scotland provides advice, if requested, to local authorities and others on the application of the Scottish transport appraisal guidance at any stage of a transport appraisal study. This uh, includes providing advice on transport appraisal reports. David Torrance. I thank the Minister for his answer. Over the last two years, has Fife Council made any representation to the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland or through Sestrans to promote the Leave Mouth Rail Link? And can the Minister tell me if it is Fife Council's top priority? Minister. Scotland has regular meetings with Sestrand to discuss rail issues, and there have been two meetings of that type this year. Neither meeting has included a specific discussion about the proposed reopening of the Leavenmouth Rail Link. In fact, I'm not aware of any representations made by the Council through Sestrand or to Transport Scotland on that issue. Uh, I should say that uh, we have had discussions, of course, with uh, local community groups about St Andrews. We've also had a member-led debate in this chamber on the issue of Hall Beath. But we've had no uh, representations that I'm aware of from the Council in relation to the uh, Leavenmouth uh, project, although we have had discussions with individual members who've shown an interest. As we stand, of course, people can make an application to the Stations Investment Fund, and we confirm that no such bids have been made by five councils so far. Very brief, because I deal. In the context of transport advice the Scottish Government gives local authorities, does the Minister agree with SNP councillor and Head of Economic Development Frank Ross that extending the Edinburgh trams is a no-brainer? Uh, Minister, briefly. Uh, 
Yeah, it's obviously a question for the council. If they'd like to extend the trams, you made it perfectly clear, as John Swinney said some years ago, that we've contributed half a billion pounds towards that project and will not uh, fund any more. So I think we've made the position clear. It's obviously up to the council if, uh, council if they want to look for further extensions. Thank you. That ends uh, general questions. We now move to first minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, presiding officer. To ask the first minister.